you are an IB history student and you are taking um, you are studying the 20th century as part of your IB history course and of course one of the major political stories of the 20th century was communism its rise and fall so you need to know something about communism and you should be able to define the characteristics or the defining features of a communist system so um, a good person to consult on that would be an Oxford professor Archie Brown, who is a contemporary author and an expert in these matters. He is the author of this book, um, The Rise and Fall of Communism. So he represents contemporary historiography, and he is somebody that you could cite in your essays if you understand him uh, in terms of his contribution to the shifting historiography of the 20th century of our understanding of communism. And of course, now we have the benefit of hindsight. The uh, Soviet archives have been opened up, and we know a lot more about the Soviet Union in particular, and about China and other t communist systems than we did 30 or 40 years ago. So Archie Brown defines six features that he calls the defining features of a communist system, and he classifies them into three categories, namely political, economic, and ideological. So what does he say? Well, he numbers them and he says, first of all, the first defining feature of a communist system is political, and that is the monopoly of power by the communist party. The communist party is completely in charge. So that's number one, and of course, those of you who have been do you, doing your reading will notice immediately um, Lenin's maxim, the dictatorship of the proletariat. And this is exactly what he meant, and exactly what he formed, and exactly what the Communist Party of the Soviet Union did in terms of monopolizing power and excluding all other political entities, excluding especially all other political parties, and throughout its 70-odd year history, the Soviet Union had a Communist Party in charge that had a monopoly of power. And, of course, other communist systems followed suit. Um, the more perceptive student may ask, does the monopoly of power demand an exclusion of all other organs of power? And the answer is essentially yes. And that's the way communist systems run. And, of course, when um, the Soviets started experimenting and other Eastern European communist systems started experimenting with um, demonopolizing the power in 1989 and 1990 and 1991, of course, the communist systems crumbled. Okay, so Archie Brown's second feature is also a political feature, and this is the feature of democratic centralism. Now this, of course, is very much featured in the communist propaganda and in the communist descriptions of their own system, but it must be said that there is a fair amount of democratic centralism within communist systems in the sense that there is debate in the Politburo at the highest levels of the Communist Party. There is debate about how to pursue policy. Now the more perceptive student would immediately say, suppose, uh, Mao was in charge or Stalin was in charge, that was a dictatorship and there was no democratic tendency, there was no democratic centralism, there was no debate. Actually, there was. And um, even when Stalin was at the height of his power as well, with the exception of some, uh, some, some battles during World War II, uh, when Stalin was at the height of his powers, uh, there was debate in the Politburo. There was debate about how to pursue Cold War policy. And um, Stalin would not infrequently remain silent and hear out his comrades in the Politburo about their opinions before policy was eventually made. Now, of course, the fear of Stalin, the fear of Mao was such that 
Uh, most people would vote the way Mao wanted, the way Stalin wanted, and many people who were debating were actually just trying to uh, win favor from the dictator. However, there was debate, there was discussion, there was um, argument about how policy should be shaped in any communist system, really, and um, at least that's because that's the, the ideology, that's the theory. There has to be democratic centralism. So to what extent that was real debate is a different question, but there was debate within the Politburo, within the uh, larger communist uh, party within the policy making organs of a communist system in virtually all of the communist systems. So those are two of the characteristics, the two political features of a communist system, namely the monopoly of power by the communist party and the democratic centralism, the argument and the debate about policy within the highest levels of the communist party. Okay, so the next two are economic and the first of those is related to the abolishment of private property. It's the abolishment of huge private monopolies over the means of production, over the main industries in the society. So that, of course, would be public ownership of the means of production. So what do I mean by public ownership of the means of production? Well, this means that you cannot have private ownership of banks, highways, major coal and steel factories, major heavy industries, the means of production by which the society must run. There must be, according to Marx, this is public ownership of this in order to have socialism or an economy that's organized along the lines of socialism that Marx envisioned, in other words, in order to have a communist system. Okay, so what is the fourth economic principle, the fourth principle, which is the second economic principle, which is a hallmark of a communist system, and of course, um, that would be a centrally planned economy. And this, of course, involves your five-year plans and all your planning coming from the center, from the top. And this involves the setting of quotas, the setting of manufacturing quotas, the setting of goals, plans to pass the capitalist world. And, of course, within the centrally planned economy, you have very little, if any, um, ability to respond and react to market forces. Therefore, with these five-year plans, you have very rigid economies that are not responsive to things like the information revolution that hit the world in the 1970s. So um, that is, those are the two economic features of a communist system. And the last two are ideological. And the first ideological feature of a communist system is a dedication and a vision of communism, a dedication to communism and a vision of a communist state. Now, this commitment to communism as an ideology will pervade every aspect of a communist society, including the educational system, the arts and culture, including uh, the propaganda, the newspapers, um, the, the movies and the TV, etc. In other words, there, the banner of communism will continuously be waved in a communist system and the idea of that propaganda is that we as a communist society, as a socialist society, are on a march to communism. Remember, within a communist society, they don't actually refer to themselves as communists. They are socialists, but communism is this ideal state in the future 
that we are scientifically marching towards because of our advanced scientific socialism. So this commitment to the communist ideal is very much a part of a communist system and is one of the six hallmarks of a communist system. And lastly, the sixth, which is also ideolo ideological, would be a commitment to the worldwide proletarian revolution. So some of you will ask, um, did all communist systems have this feature? And that's an interesting question. Uh, originally, according to Lenin, and especially Trotsky, the idea was that the Russian Revolution and communism in Russia or socialism in Russia was just a small part of an international proletariat revolution and that soon the toiling masses, the, exploiting, the exploited working classes of Germany, England, the United States, etc., would join in this international proletarian revolution and then that we would have a communist or a socialist system worldwide, or at least in the developed world. And um, of course it didn't pan out that way and it was Stalin who made the adjustment and he came up with a motto that was socialism in one country, meaning that socialism could be built first in the Soviet Union without necessarily having the commitment to the worldwide proletarian revolution, at least not to the extent that it was envisioned under Lenin and particularly as it was envisioned by Trotsky. So Stalin's socialism in one country puts a qualifier on the sixth characteristic of a, communism, of, of a communist system. Stalin, of course, was at different times in his career more or less attached to the idea of a worldwide communist system. And of course, as we have talked about in class, Stalin saw the world in concentric circles moving outward from Moscow, so he was very much committed to the communist system in Eastern Europe and in the buffer states as he saw them around the Soviet Union, largely because he wanted those countries to be um, obedient to him or, as he would say, friendly to socialism because he was worried about the aggressive nature of the capitalist states. So those are the six characteristics, or as Archie Brown says, the six defining features of a communist system.